And will it be functional after you've made it? Those are the three most important things to any kind of armor or props because it's all really well and good to make like a six foot steel sword and walk around like a badass, but if you can't carry it around all day at a convention, yeah, it kind of doesn't help you very much. So, what we're going to do, we have um, three different levels of materials. Uh, I would call them level one, uh, which is basically stuff that you could give to a kid and they could do it with, that's like papers, clays, um, you know, like simple materials, stuff that you can use just like regular uh, paste on. There's level two materials, which is uh, like the foams, stuff like that is stuff that you would need like special tools for, like hand tools, power tools. Uh, and then level three materials, which is stuff that you actually potentially badly hurt yourself or you kill yourself. Um, that's stuff like wood, leather, fiberglass, stuff that like you can make something that will last forever and look amazing. But that's like professional grade. So let's start off with level one though. All right, uh, level one. The first thing we're going to talk about is a cliche. Emily here has made us this wonderful made crochet sword. Um, what this sword is, is it is a PVC pipe that has a couple of pieces of the foam core poster board inside and then she covered it with the uh, paper mache. Um, now, there are a couple different kinds of paper mache in the world. Uh, the recipe that I usually use, and that most people like immediately go to because it's the cheapest, is the one where you take uh, one cup of flour, one cup of water, and a pinch of salt, mix it all together until it looks like a lumpy oatmeal, and then kind of run your stuff to that. Um, this is obviously really cheap, really easy to do, because everybody has flour in their kitchen. Water comes out of the tap, salt ferments mold, but you, know, you don't need a whole lot of it. Um, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily hold up really well if, uh, like, you're heating it for a long time or if you keep it in, like, an attic in the savannah where it gets to, like, 100 degrees in the summer. So, um, another kind of paper mache that might work a bit better is if you were making paper mache uh, with paste. And the way that you would do that is you would take a little bit of paste, like the, um, the school glue, like the Elmer's school glue, uh, mix it in with a little bit of water so that it's super diluted. What happens is that when the water evaporates, the glue stays and stays permanent. Wallpaper paste works fantastic for this. It sells up real good. Um, the third kind of paper mache is a little bit more tricky. It's something that's known as paper clay. Um, and essentially, there's a couple different ways of making it. Uh, we actually use paper clay for the handle down there. Uh, do you want to talk? Like what you did for that? Um, well, for my whole thing, the paper mache mixture that I used was uh, flour, and then actually I just put random amounts of glue in it and random amounts of water um, just to get the consistency of like pancake batter. And I think also if you use cake flour, that's better because it's really thin, so it'll make it like more um, stronger overall. And then for the paper clay part, it wasn't technically paper clay, but I just took toilet paper and then um, soaked it in the paper mache stuff, and it pretty much just makes itself into paper, um, paper, what's it called? Clay. Yeah, clay. I just blanked out. But yeah, then I use that. Um, there is also a really good recipe that we have online that um, is very similar. You start off with toilet paper, you soak it for a long time until it absorbs all the water, wring it out until it's nice and dry and fluffy, and you mix it in with some of the um, joint compound which is actually made for like drywall. It's like a putty. You kind of mix it in with that uh, and a little bit of Elmer's glue. And when it sets up, it sets up rock hard. It essentially becomes like stone and uh, it will last forever. But if you want something that is able to, you know, stand the test of time a little bit better than paper and shape, I recommend using this stuff. This is rigid wrap. Pretty strong stuff. Uh, if you've ever broken a bone, this is the stuff they use for your cast. Uh, and what it is, is it's just these little strips of linen that are covered in plaster powder. And um, then when you get them wet, 
they just stick together and form into like a shape that will stay that way forever. Uh, the only problem with this is that if you get it wet, it becomes soggy, loses its shape, and it won't work anymore. Turn hey. this. We're just gonna you know, watch it. Okay, that's cool. Um, so the next one that I wanted to talk about is uh, some of the uh, materials that I use to make this. This is a uh, David Gax. I made it with a uh, foam core board and a dowel rod. The whole thing cost me less than five dollars. Um, foam core board is an excellent material to use because it's really cheap. Um, I got this stuff at the Dollar Tree, and essentially what foam core is is, is just a piece of paper with some closed cell foam glued to the back of it, and then another piece of paper glued to that. Um, it's relatively rigid, uh, and unlike cardboard, when you bend it, it doesn't get the uh, weird, nasty creases that cardboard gets when you bend that. Now, cardboard. When most people think of cardboard, they think of this kind of stuff, the corrugate. Uh, it's called that because if you looked inside, what it is is it's actually a bunch of little crinkles of cardboard. Uh, that give it space, and um, I mean this is also really cheap stuff. You can get like these display boards at the Dollar Tree, you can get boxes at liquor stores for free, um, and there's lots of good stuff that you can make out of both of these materials as long as you want to take the time to do it. Uh, really all it is is a matter of being able to have the patience to sit down, make yourself a pattern, cut it out of these materials, and put in the proper amount of work, and you can make really amazing looking stuff out of um, in terms of clays, there are two particular kinds of clays that I like to use. The first is Sculpey clay. Sculpey clay is a polymer-based clay. That means it is oil-based. You bake this uh, at uh, 275 degrees Fahrenheit for a quarter inch for, for 15 minutes, which is what it says on the package. To me, that seems awfully specific and doesn't usually work that well. So what I do is I just crank my oven up to 300 degrees, <laughs> throw it in there, turn it off, and then wait for it to cool off. And then by the time the oven's cool, this stuff is hardened up and tore off. Anyone who's taken 3D design will know that you use this to make like your cats. Um, and it comes in a bunch of different flavors, but this right here is the generic sculpt. It's pretty awful stuff, I gotta be honest. Um, like, I'm going to break off a piece here, like, you can see it crumbles, it's not super good, and then even when you work it a little bit and you warm it up so that it's malleable and you're able to mold it, this stuff gets really tacky when it uh, gets warmed up, see, like, already, I've already got it so that it's able to be molded. Um, but once you've been handling this for a while, it gets really, really tacky and it will stick to your fingers makes detail work very difficult. So this stuff isn't so good. But what you can get, and what I recommend that you get, is the Super Sculpey, or also the female clays, which is a step up from that. It's a bit stiffer. It's able to be able to be worked in a much more realistic way. Um, like Sculpey clay, you can get like a big case of it for like 60 bucks, but you, you don't want to use it. It's good for like making practices, making like little Pandora beads, but other than that, it's really not going to be good. Um, speaking of not being good for anything, modeling clay. Um, here's why this is a particularly good product. It dries in the air, which is a good thing if you want to make like horns or claws or like embroidery on your armor so that it's nice and light. But the problem with that is um, you, you can't stop it hardening up. <laughs> And uh, once it does, you can't do anything with it. Um, so it's not particularly good stuff. Um, you have to kind of use it all at once, which is a pain. But like I said, it does have its place. If you're trying to make horns, or if you want to do like filler for your armor, this stuff costs four bucks for a big thing like this. So it's you know pretty useful. Um, so we also have. Thanks to Emily again, these really awesome paper feathers, um, which were actually part of a project that we were working on for wings, but uh, yeah, it kind of So, um, 
paper and just regular cardboard. This is like cereal cardboard. This kind of stuff can be used if you want to make like Papakura. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it is a um, program that you can get online. And anything that you can make a 3D model of, you can put into this program. It will break it down into polygons for you. And then you just have to glue them together so as to make a 3D model shape. It's really, really cool. It takes a lot of time to make it. It's stupid easy to do because you're just gluing edges together. But you have to be able to devote tons of hours to doing it because there's lots of little individual cuts that have to be made. But if you're making Papakura, I would recommend using regular cereal box cardboard. It works really well, actually. It's pretty durable. Um, it's relatively tough. And then if you put like a uh, resin on top of this, it should harden up and not move and be perfectly good like forever. So, those are the level of materials. Now, when you start making armors, you're going to want to do something like this. It may not look like much now. In fact, it kind of looks like a bizarre spacesuit. But um, this is actually my armor making mannequin. Um, the way that you would make one of these is you get a friend to wrap you up in duct tape. Uh, wearing a long sleeve shirt that you don't want anymore because you're going to be cutting yourself out of it. Um, and make sure that it's somebody who you're super close to because, yeah, they're going to be cutting you out of this. You will not be able to move at all once you've been wrapped. Um, <laughs> and then once you have this and you get yourself out of it, you stuff it with newspaper so that it fits your right body shape. And that way, when you're making armors, you can mold it onto that, which doesn't feel pain or heat. And you don't have to worry about burning yourself. So, yay, not burning yourself. Model making um, style, uh, mannequins like that are a really useful thing if you're going to be making a lot of stuff fitted for yourself, and you, especially if you don't have anyone to help you. Because then you can get the measurements directly from that. You don't have to worry about like trying to safety pin things in place on yourself or something like that. So, the next thing, though, is we're going to talk about level two materials. Level two materials are basically, for us, going to be foams, uh, which consists of two different varieties. We have closed cell foams and open cell foams. Closed cell foams are these rigid uh, kind of boards that are usually used for like insulation. And uh, they come in a couple of different varieties. This is uh, polystyrene foam. It's your basic white styrofoam. Um, it's not super amazing stuff. You can break it with absurd ease. Um, but if you put a lot of it together and you laminate it together with glue, you can carve directly into this and it will be able to make really awesome props, really light, and it's really cheap. Like, I got eight of these sheets that are like eight feet tall for like, 16 bucks at Home Depot. Um, so polystyrene foam, um, it's called that because when you started off life, it was these itty bitty little polystyrene beads, these things. Uh, and um, they put them in a puffer, pretty much, and they puffed up and then they steamed it together into these sheets. When you're carving these, you're going to want to use either a uh, X-Acto knife, or a hot wire cutter if you can get one, because hot wire cutters will uh, actually melt through this, uh, which will allow you to shape it a lot easier than if you're trying to go at it with like a box cutter, because it just shreds. Um, another variety of the uh, polystyrene is the Pink Panther foam. Uh, again, if any of you have taken 3D Design or Sculpture 1, you probably know Pink Panther foam. It is super awesome stuff. It's really light, comes in big sheets. Uh, you get it in three different thicknesses, half inch, uh, which is this stuff, two, well, actually no. This is the one inch, that's the two inch, and you get it in the half inch. You get it in real big sheets and you can laminate it together. Um, something I need to mention, when we're talking about any kind of foam like this, when you laminate it together, you have to use the right kind of glue. If you're not using the right kind of glue, it will eat it. Um, with both the Pink Panther and the uh, regular Styrofoam, if you're using, say, a spray adhesive, 
it will eat it. It will literally melt right through the styrofoam. It's no good. Um, if you're using super glue or modeling glue or even Elmer's glue, it will melt right through this stuff. Don't do it. But if you get the Gorilla Glue, that works really well. Um, and you can lay down a layer of Gorilla Glue and then you can actually layer these one on top of each other, clamp them together. You get a nice solid piece that you can carve into. Um, and the Pink Panther Foam actually comes in three different flavors. Uh, the pink, which, I mean, you guys can feel these when we take our break. It's, you know, pretty light, it's pretty tough. Um, this is the middle of the road stuff. You can also get this in blue, which I have not been able to find anywhere in person. You have to order that online, I think. That is so tough, you can actually simulate wood with it. That's good stuff. It's not cheap. Um, and then there's green, which is this, which is the really soft foam. And I mean, I'm just using my finger and a little bit of pressure. You can see I'm already digging right into that. Um, this is mostly used for like floral foams. Um, this is really good if you want to create like really small shapes because um, you can carve it really easily, but it is also most prone to breaking, unfortunately. But those are the open cell foams. Open cell foams are things that are meant to be rigid, they're meant to be able to stand up and you know basically be uh, able to withstand kind of a pretty good amount of damage. Um, you'd use these mostly for, if you're making like swords or weapons or props like that, um, but we're not intending to hit someone with them, because, yeah, <laughs> as soon as you hit anybody with it, it um, it's going to break before the person does. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you don't want to be using this kind of stuff if you're going to be making like uh, buffer weapons or stuff for LARPs. For that, you'd want to use more of the closed cell phone. Now, uh, open cell phone, sorry. Open cell phone is basically called EVA phone. I know what it stands for, I just don't remember what, they, what it is. It's ethyl vinyl, no, expanded vinyl something. Anyway, um, EVA phone uh, comes in three major thicknesses. You get it from craft stores like this. This is the 16th inch. You can actually even cut this stuff with like a ballpoint pen. This is fantastic for little details. Um, you get it in the eighth inch, um, which is exactly the same stuff. It's just, you know, thicker. You can get it in a bunch of different colors and you get it in the quarter inch. Uh, the quarter inch stuff you will mostly find in like uh, hardware stores or like gym supply stores. This is the kind of stuff people put down in like the floor of their garage or in their home gym um, so that they're not laying right on the floor. And it comes in these nifty little squares, which is nice. And, or, or you can get them in rolls sometimes, like you have a roll. Um, it comes with the uh, little diamond pattern on the back. You don't need to worry about that, I mean, unless you want to have like a diamond pattern on something. Um, all that this is, because if you feel it during the break, you'll notice that this has kind of a uh, different texture to it. You know, like this is a lot harder. And what they've done is they've actually taken the regular foam and they have sprayed it with liquid latex over the top. Now, um, does anybody know like the Nerf and Strike Swords? Yeah, it's exactly the same process. They took a PVC core, they took some of this exact kind of foam, this EVA foam, and then they spray paint it over the top of it with liquid latex. And that's what gives it the um, consistency. And you know, if you know those kinds of swords, you know that they're you know, a pretty good product as far as like buffer type swords go. Open cell foam is what you want to use if you want to actually be hitting anyone. Uh, <laughs> um, because it's you know, fairly soft. It's not going to really hurt too much. Um, and it comes in a variety of uh, foams, like the EVA foam is mostly like a kind of rigid type foam, which you can form using heat. Uh, but there's also upholstery foam, which can be used uh, to make like padding for costumes or armor or anything like that. So while we're on the subject of how to cut this stuff, 
These are called level two materials because they sometimes require specialty equipment. Um, some of the things you are likely going to use with some of these are things like a hot glue gun. Hot glue guns are hot. I know it sounds stupid to say that, but I guarantee at some point you will burn yourself with this and the first thing out of your mouth will be, fuck, that's hot. <laughs> and then I will say, I told you so. <laughs> Um, hot glue guns work by taking basically these little plastic rods and they melt them into molten plastic, which then sets up and stays pretty good. Um, it doesn't stick to everything necessarily, but it's a good universal kind of glue, mostly. Um, and it, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you get the right temperature of hot glue. There are a couple different kinds. There's the low melting temperature hot glue and the high melting temperature. Low melting temperature hot glue is mostly for like patch jobs or crafts. I mean, it works. They all work, but again, if you're going to a convention in August in Georgia, you're sitting out in the car, your stuff's baking in the sun, the low melting temperature hot glue is going to weaken up and let go. And so you want to get the high melting temperature hot glue, which this stuff melts at I think like 400 degrees, something like that. So it's definitely uh, a lot better if you're going to be in like a hot place trying to do this. Um, some of the other things you might want is you might think about getting yourself a soldering iron. Uh, this is just a little craft soldering iron. Uh, but what I mostly use it for, and what I really like about it, is uh, it comes with a little hot knife attachment. It doesn't look like much. This gets scalding hot. It's hot. Don't touch. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but the good news about that is that once you've got a hot knife attachment like this, you can cut this EVA foam like a hot knife through butter. I mean, it's fantastic for that. It works really, uh, you can cut this stuff, you know, with like a regular X-Acto knife or even a box cutter too but like a hot soldering iron hot knife attachment works perfectly for this. Um, another thing you might consider getting yourself is a hot or is a uh, heat gun. You can get a bunch of different kinds of heat guns. Um, this one actually gives me the ability to see what temperature I have, which is good. Low end temperature is 250 degrees. High end temperature is 1,350 degrees. That's hot. It is hot enough to melt glass. Do not touch. Do not put this on a surface that can combust. Do not put this onto your carpet because it will melt it. And whatever you do, do not test to see if it's on by doing this to yourself. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. Now, when you got your heat gun, though, you can tell if it's on because, one, a little light will say that it's on. Two, if you put your hand anywhere near it, you'll tell that it's hot. Don't put it in front. Don't do it. Um, and three, because it will smell, you know, like hot metal. You should be able to tell if it's on right away. And the way that you would actually work this is you go in a couple inches, like four to five inches above the surface of your EVA foam. You just go back and forth like this, nice and gentle the whole time, until it discolors. It turns sort of a slightly darker color, and that shows that you're able to bend it. Once it turns white, it means you're burning it. You need to stop, because I'm relatively sure this stuff is toxic when it burns. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you made your armor? Was it uh, for me? I didn't do any like anything fancy, like use a like, hot knife, but I did cut it out with uh, with uh, foam cutting scissors, like mm -hmm. industrial scissors. And for those really good sharp, you know, cuts, I used a regular exacto blade. Threw it all together with a, a hot glue gun. This should be. I'm pretty sure this is high temperature hot glue, so uh, yeah, it it's not going to come apart anytime soon unless. The first thing it's going to give is the foam, right. if I try pulling it apart, so it was pretty easy actually. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty easy stuff to work with once you know what you're doing. Um, 
and it goes really quick. Like the wonderful thing about this stuff, particularly the thicker, is that if you wanted to do puppet cure, you could actually modify the model uh, so as to allow for the thickness of this, so that you don't have to worry about the inside edges, and make it like twice as fast. Because you can heat this stuff up and you can mold it however you want it, and it works fine. The last thing that I'm going to talk about on this tool is my Dremel. If you don't have a Dremel, it's a, it's a rotary tool, it's technically what it's called, but it's one of those things like Xerox where everybody knows it by the brand name. If you don't have a Dremel, you should get one because I guarantee this will be the single most useful tool you will ever own. It does everything. You can grind with it, you can cut with it, you can drill with it, you can engrave with it. I mean, it's a fantastic tool. Um, this cost me, I think, like 20 bucks at Walmart. Um, comes in two speeds, and I love this thing. I use it all the time. I'm super disappointed because I've actually lost some of my uh, little drill bits for it. But it is a super useful tool. You're going to love having one of these. And you can use it on the foam to like, kind of shave off the edges. You can use it to drill uh, into like uh, PVC or plastic or things like that. You can use it to cut wood even. Um, it, you can use it for like just about everything. You will love having this. So get yourself a Dremel when you get yourself set up with your own studio. All right. Finally, we come to the level three materials. Level three materials are things that you require, you know, a little bit of expertise in how to use, like say wood or metal or leather or fiberglass or even plastic. Now, I mentioned PVC before, um, and unfortunately we don't have any examples of that. But you guys know what PVC pipe is, right? It's that white pipe you get at Home Depot. Um, but what you can do is it, like the EVA foam, can become flexible when you heat it up. When you heat it up, you can change its shape. You can make it flat. You can make it bowed. You can make bows and swords and all kinds of really cool stuff with that. And it stays in that shape when it cools. Um, this is actually a sign material uh, that one of the people in our build team showed me, which is really cool. And I wish I could remember what it was called. Yeah. Um, but basically what this stuff is, like, you know those signs you see on the side of the road, ones that are like stuck into the ground? That's what this is. It's a plastic, um, but like the EVA foam, you heat this up and you can form it. You can shape form this when you heat it up. Um, so it works really well and then it stays in that shape. Um, the best stuff for that though, in terms of like moldable plastics, is stuff like warbler. Warbler, for those of you who don't know, comes in nice thin sheets. You can get it online. I don't know any actual crafts that you can buy it. I but, think it's uh, only sold in Europe right now. Yeah, so you can buy it online though. Uh, it comes in nice thin sheets. You can cut it with an exacto knife or scissors or whatever you want. And then when you heat it up, it becomes pliable. And then when you apply it to something, it stays in that position and it cools off and it stays in that position. I will warn you though, if you're going to be molding stuff to yourself, Orbla has a temperament to it. Um, it is a very thin line between not heated up enough and heated up too much to the point where you're burning it. And it also gets really hot. So if you're molding it to yourself, you're going to want to be wearing long sleeves because it, it gets you know, really hot. Um, the good news about Warble, though, is that you can actually adhere it to itself. Uh, if you heat it up and you crimp the edges together, the plastic fuses, becomes one single piece, and you can never, ever take it apart again. Which is good news if you want to do that, and bad news if you're working and it accidentally sticks to itself because it's never coming apart. Um, some of the other materials that we can use are things like wood. This is just regular balsa wood. Uh, you can cut this you know, pretty easily. You can cut it with like a um, X-Acto knife or like a rotary tool or 
a Dremel. Um, moving up a bit, this is actually um, one by eight copper. Um, you want to try getting clear grain woods if you're going to be making like swords or stuff out of wood, uh, just because it will be a bit easier to sand and also it looks a bit nicer, it's a little more tough. Um, for stuff like this, what you want to do is you want to draw out your uh, pattern on it. And you can, you know, laminate this stuff together like some of the pieces here have done, where you just like kind of glue them to, uh, layer to layer. Um, and then you cut it out. The only problem with wood like this is you for sure need a saw to cut this stuff. You'd want like a jigsaw, like a hand jigsaw, or even better if you have to have one, a band saw. That makes real quick work of this, but um, it, you can cut it with a handsaw, but it takes forever, and you don't really have a whole lot of control with a handsaw that way. Um, so intricate cuts, you're going to want a jigsaw for that kind of thing. Um, I don't have any examples of leather or fiberglass or anything like that, but if that's your bag, definitely go for it. Um, I will just warn you that you can really badly hurt yourself with fiberglass. Um, you need to make sure that you know what you're doing with any of these materials. Uh, and which is why I'm actually going to pass over to Professor Ramsey now, who's going to be talking about casting and molding, since I don't know anything about that. So, okay. Yay. Okay. Well, if you guys ever in elementary school made a plaque for your parents about taking your hands and pushing it in play, you've made a mold. Okay. So, mold making is not that sophisticated. But, of course, like the more um, particular the application, there are different materials. You have to pay really close attention to what you actually want. But the whole idea behind mold making is that you have an original, whether it's something that you make or something that you find, and then you make the negative of it, which is what this is, and in turn, you have an original, you have a negative, and then you have a positive. So it's a negative, positive, negative reaction. Now, um, we're in the sculpture room right here, so you're going to see a lot of mold making around you, and you'll see a lot of multiples. And that's why I was saying it's very important for you to find something that's appropriate for your use. Ex Libris, not that I'm you know, a marketer for Ex Libris, sells a lot of products by this company Smooth On for sculpture. But Smooth On is also an excellent source for the special effects industry makeup. If you ever watched uh, Face Off on Sci-Fi, they use a lot of the same kind of products. So my expertise is actually in art models. So my students will make an original, we take a, a mold out of it, and then create multiples which are eventually wax. But in some of the other sculpture classes and some of the other processes, there are kits that are called body double, and they use a faster setting silicone. And so here I have an example of a student who took a life mass of their face, which was done with a very thin, supple, fast setting polyurethane material. You didn't have to use that rigid wrap to support it, but the minute you get this done, start taking wax off of it, or you can take a plaster cast of your original, you can model on it, take another negative, and then you can do whatever you want to with it. So uh, this place, Smooth On, has excellent resources online, and they're not the only place, but they sell things like zombie kits, they sell um, all sorts of materials that you can actually use to make prosthetics to apply for yourself that are safe to use because they're non-toxic. But, like I said, you really kind of have to know what you want in 